A 10 year old girl was just feet from her home, but she would never be seen alive again. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Haley Owens. Viewer discretion is advised. Haley Owens was born on August 18th, 2003, and she was born in Springfield, Missouri. Haley was described as kind of like a mix between, you know, your typical girly girl who loved princess stuff, painting her nails. You know, she loved playing uh, dress up and make believe. She liked to pretend she lived in a princess castle. But then she also loved being just like out in the mud, just like playing and roughing it. Uh, and some would describe her as kind of also like a tomboy. Her family said she was a very uh, high-spirited young girl, full of energy, full of love, full of light, someone who was just always smiling, always laughing, and who was just always making everyone around her just chuckle. She wasn't your typical kid either in terms of like, you know, kids who usually hate doing chores. She loved helping her mom around the house. She loved to help do laundry. She helped love doing the dishes. Uh, she helped uh, learning how to cook with her mom. Haley was someone who just loved to talk. She can just talk and talk and talk and keep going. And, you know, she always had the best little stories to tell. She loved music. She loved dancing. She loved going to church with her family. At the time of this story, she was a fourth grader at Westport Elementary, and she was popular amongst, you know, all the students there. She wasn't shy, and she just got along with everyone. Unfortunately, she would not get to live past 10 years. It was a Tuesday, February 18th, 2014. It was approximately 4.30 in the afternoon. Haley was over at a friend's house playing, and it was just, just down the street from where she lived in Springfield, Missouri. Like, the same neighborhood, same block, same street and everything on Lombard Street. And at approximately 4.40, she was done playing with the friend, and she was going to be going home. And she was going to be walking down the sidewalk just down the street to her house. I mean, literally, we're talking a few houses down. That same afternoon, on that same exact street, a married couple, Carlos and Michelle Edwards, they were doing some work in their garage. So as Carlos Edwards is doing uh, some yard work and kind of going back and forth between the yard and the garage of his house, he sees a, um, a pickup truck, specifically a tan Ford Ranger, and it's driving down the road kind of slowly. He also notices Haley on the opposite side of the street on the sidewalk, uh, literally just maybe a couple houses down from where she lived. Carlos notices this tan truck kind of stop and roll down the window and he can hear him asking Haley for directions somewhere. He was looking for a particular road or a street. You know, Haley being 10 years old really wasn't familiar with giving directions. Um, and so she, Carlos said, he, she said, I don't know where that street is. I'm sorry. And so... It appeared that was going to be it. The truck was going to drive away and Haley was just going to keep walking. And that's what Haley did. She just continued to walk down the sidewalk. Then Carlos heard the man say, hey, come here for a minute. And then he said he saw Haley kind of walk towards the truck. And what happens next, it, it happens so quickly and Carlos and Michelle weren't close enough to quickly stop this from happening. All of a sudden, the driver, who was described as a white male with kind of longer hair, he reached out of his truck and he snatched Haley and just yanked her into the truck. And then he sped off kind of all in the same process. And so Carlos, he begins to book it. He's like running down the street after this truck, screaming for it to stop, screaming for help. And he's, he's chasing it. Uh, but unfortunately, he's just not fast enough. The truck gets away. As Carlos is like running after the truck, Michelle is going into the house calling 911. And, and thankfully, Michelle got a really good look at the license plate. And she told the police like everything that happened, you know, this young girl was just stolen uh, from off the road. 
She told 911 that the license plate was 1YF454. Carlos uh, runs to the house that uh, Haley lived in. He bangs on the door. He's knocking, screaming, please, you know, I think Haley was just taken. And so now the family is aware. Everyone, this neighborhood is now on high alert. Everyone begins to kind of canvas the area. Uh, the mom is also calling 911, even though Michelle did. Uh, and then eventually police kind of quickly convene there in the neighborhood and they get witness statements from everyone as other police officers are now driving around trying to find this truck, possibly even um, the little girl. Now, thankfully, because they were able to get that license plate number, they were able, the police were able to plug it in and find out kind of where that car was registered. And it brought them to the house of a family known as the Woods, and they lived in Ash Grove. So police go to that house as quickly as possible. They knock on the door and um, they explain the situation. The truck isn't in the driveway or anything like that. And it's like an older couple who says, well, that truck actually belongs to our son. And their son's name was Craig Michael Wood. They said that he didn't live in that house, but they gave them the address of the house where he did live. Craig kind of fit the description as well of, of the man that was seen behind the wheel of the truck. And, you know, he had long kind of gray hair. He was a white male. He was a 45-year-old uh, employee of the local school district. He was actually a youth football coach. So police go to Craig's house. And when they get there, they don't see the truck anywhere. They don't, uh, they knock on the door, nobody answers. They're like asking neighbors, have you guys seen him? And they said he's been gone for a couple of hours. So as other police are still searching the area, trying to find this, you know, poor little girl, as well as family and volunteers, other police officers are basically sitting there at that house waiting for Craig to come home. And then finally at 8.30 PM, that truck pulls into the driveway. And it's the exact same Ford Ranger that was described by Carlos and Michelle. And the license plate was the exact license plate. Craig got out of the truck. Um, he appeared to throw something in the bed of the truck. And then he kind of noticed police and police sort of to walk towards him. And he essentially stated that he knew why they were there. Police described him as smelling heavily heavily of bleach. They asked him where he was just now, and he said he was just at a Walmart, he had gone to a laundromat, um, and that's basically what he'd been doing the past you know, hour or two. When they looked kind of closer at Craig, they noticed he had scratches on his neck. He had blood, dried blood on right below his lip. He had blood on some of his fingers. Even though he said he had an idea of why police were there, he never actually specified what he meant by that. Uh, but police would take him into the station because they wanted to question him. Haley wasn't with him. He, she wasn't in the truck. And when they brought him to the station, they took some photos of him. They noticed more scratches kind of underneath his shirt uh, to go along with the ones on his neck. And he still refused to answer any questions with regards to Haley or if he knew anything about this young girl being taken. But police did have enough evidence to get a warrant to search his house. And that's exactly what they did. The moment they go in the house, it smells just so badly of bleach. Like it is permeating uh, throughout the entire house. And it gets stronger as they go towards his basement. And as they go down the steps of his basement, the bleach smell is overwhelming. The stairs and the ground of the basement were like still soaking wet as if someone had literally just tried cleaning it. And there were a couple of fans like blowing in the basement. Other officers are searching around the house. They notice that his bed has no sheets on it. All the sheets seem to be gone. Uh, they noticed he had diaries that had stories about sexualizing little girls. He had photographs of young girls from the school where he worked. And then back in the basement, they're doing, um, they're kind of searching the whole thing and they noticed some large containers like tubs um, kind of in a corner. And when they open up a lid, the search for Haley ended. Haley's body was in a garbage bag in one of these containers. 
it was clear that she was doused in bleach um, as if someone had tried to wash her with it. She had bruises all throughout her body. She had uh, marks on her wrists that looked as if she had been tied up with something. She had been shot in the back of the head. It was a 22 caliber bullet that they recovered and it went directly through her brain. They found a rifle in the house and they were able to match that gun with the bullets that were found. Not only um, bullet, you know, shell casings, but also the bullet found near her body. And it was a match. It was the same weapon that shot her. She was also sexually assaulted. They didn't have her clothing anywhere in the house. Uh, and so police were kind of like tracing steps from where she was taken to Craig's house. And they found a little strip mall that was on the way. And they found they were searching dumpsters in the area. And there was one dumpster that they found Haley's uh, clothing. They actually have Craig on CCTV throwing those items of clothing into that dumpster. They verified that he went to Walmart, and as a matter of fact, they picked him up on camera at Walmart buying the bleach, and this was roughly an hour or so after Haley was taken off of the sidewalk. They had Craig uh, dead to rights. I mean, obviously the body's in his basement, but you know, they have the evidence against him is you, you just can't even, you can't break it. You can't break it down in any way. Um, <laughs> No uh, defense lawyer would be able to argue anything uh, because, you know, again, you have his truck uh, literally being witnessed at the kidnapping, getting of her being t put into that truck. The description of the man behind the wheel um, by Carlos and his wife was identical to what Craig actually looked like. I, you know, they have him buying the bleach. They have him on camera throwing away her clothing. They have her body in his basement. The gun that shot her was his. I mean, this was a slam dunk. And so he was charged with first degree murder and kidnapping charges. And the prosecution was like, we're going for the death penalty on this one. And the defense, Craig's defense was like, they they basically said he did it. I mean, they they just said, we know he did it. But he didn't do it for the reasons or in the situation that you guys are saying he did. His defense tried to play it off like this was a totally impromptu, spur-of-the-moment thing. That he was just driving down that street and he just happened to notice Haley. And because he had all of these urges from seeing all these like girls at the school he worked at, having all these uh, you know fantasies about young girls, that he just, he just acted on it. He was also high, uh, very high, on meth. He was a meth user and at the time of this situation, he was on it. He was literally on it. So the jury found him guilty of first degree murder. When it came time to sentencing him, the jury was not, they weren't unanimous on voting for the death penalty, but in the state of Missouri, if the jury cannot decide unanimously on a death sentence or any sentence, then it goes to the judge. And so the judge said, you got the death penalty. He based all of this just off the fact that this was such a brutal murder. They came to the conclusion that for about 45 minutes, Haley was sexually assaulted and tortured by this man, a stranger. They didn't know each other. They had never met. He had never seen her. That much is true. She had never seen him. But he just brutally, brutally just made this poor little girl's life a living hell uh, for the last hour of her life. Craig Woods, who has over the years seemingly just kept gaining and gaining weight, uh, he has tried to appeal numerous times the death sentence, but every time he's lost the appeal um, and his death sentence still remains. When all of this happened, the entire community, and we're talking, I mean, there's thousands of people flooded the streets with doing a candlelit vigil for Haley Owens. They were all there to support her and her family 
And it's really kind of just a beautiful image just to see how many people were there. On the offset of all of this, uh, Haley's Law uh, came into play. Apparently, when this first happened, I guess an Amber Alert wasn't issued like immediately for whatever reason. And so Amber's Law basically now makes it a requirement, from what I understand, to essentially be issued immediately, the, the moment it's reported. It took about six years for it to pass into actual law, but it was passed into law. I don't know if an Amber Alert necessarily would have saved her. It may have, but it sounds like Craig just took her and then within an hour she was gone. But at least Haley Owens and her family got the justice they deserved. And hopefully Haley Owens is resting in peace. But that is it for this case, True Crime Maroonies. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you have tripped, fallen, and stumbled your way into this video, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories, you knuckleheads. Uh, so please feel free to subscribe to me here. Give this uh, video a like so it's seen by more people. And then if you like to, you can also follow my other socials. The links are in the uh, link tree in the description below, uh, including my TikTok, where I have close to 3 million followers. Uh, and uh, I tell true crime stuff as well as other videos over there as well. If there's a case that you want me to cover, please email me. That information is also below. Uh, just email me the name of the person, where it happened, when it happened, and I will add it to my list. In terms of when I cover it, I can't tell you when because I pick my cases at random, just to be fair. So eventually it'll be covered. I just don't know when. Uh, next, if you want to support me in any way, we do sell merch t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. We do ship all over the world. Uh, so it's also in the link tree below. And then lastly, if you have a Discord account and you want to join my Discord server, please be over the age of 18 or you will be kicked out of there. Uh, but that's also linked in the link tree below skis. All right, skis. Stop saying skis at the end of everything. Skis, 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 skis. Have you ever gone skiing before? I haven't. I'm too fat to go skiing, I think. I think I would topple over, roll down the hill, and cause an avalanche. Destroy, like, an entire city. A lot of people would be, would be lost if I tried skiing and fell. Where am I going with this? What is this? Don't go skiing. It causes avalanches and kills people. What? That's not a way to end a video. Ha, 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 ha,